This is Creepy, a podcast dedicated to sharing the most famous, chilling, and disturbing creepy pastas and urban legends in the world. Whether these stories truly happened or are simply fabrications is for you to decide. These stories may contain graphic depictions of violence and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Creepy Presents Urban Legends Part 1 For the last two years, you've heard an intro that includes the words creepypasta and urban legends. While I'd like to think we've been doing a good job on the former, I realize we've fallen a bit behind on the latter. So a few months ago, I reached out to the listeners on social media to find out what your favorite urban legends are. Over the next few episodes, we're going to dive into your requests. First up, narrator Victoria Wan is going to tell us why it's so important that we don't turn on the light. She commandeered the room in the basement of her dorm as soon as she realized she would have to pull an all-nighter in order to prepare for tomorrow's final exam. Her roommate, Jenna, liked to get to bed early, so she packed up everything she thought she would need and went downstairs to study. And study. And study some more. It was two o'clock when she realized that she'd left one of the textbooks upstairs on her bed. With a dramatic sigh, she rose and climbed the stairs slowly to her third-floor dorm room. The lights were dim in the long hallway, and the old boards creaked under her weary tread. She reached her room and turned the handle as softly as she could, pushing the door open just enough to slip inside so that the hallway lights wouldn't wake her roommate. The room was filled with a strange metallic smell. She frowned a bit, her arms breaking out into chills. There was a strange feeling of malice in the room, as if a malevolent gaze were fixed upon her. It was a mind trick. The all-nighter was catching up with her. She could hear Jenna breathing on the far side of the room. A heavy sound, almost as if she had been running. Jenna must have picked up a cold during the last tense week before finals. She crept along the wall until she reached her bed, groping among the covers for the stray history textbook. In the silence, she could hear a steady drip, drip, drip sound. She sighed silently. Facilities would have to come to fix a sink in the bathroom. Again. Her fingers closed on the textbook. She picked it up softly and withdrew from the room as silently as she could. Relieved to be out of the room, she hurried back downstairs, collapsed into an overstuffed chair, and studied until six o'clock. She finally decided that enough was enough. If she slipped upstairs now, she could get a couple hours sleep before her nine o'clock exam. The first of the sun's rays were beaming through the windows as she slowly slid the door open, hoping not to awaken Jenna. Her nose was met by an earthy, metallic smell a second before her eyes registered the scene in her dorm room. Jenna was spread-eagled on top of her bed against the far wall, her throat cut from ear to ear and her nightdress stained with blood. Two drops of blood fell from the saturated blanket with a drip, drip noise that sounded like a leaky faucet. Scream after scream poured from her mouth, but she couldn't stop herself any more than she could cease wringing her hands. All along the hallway, doors slammed and footsteps came running down the passage. Within moments, other students had gathered in her doorway, and one of her friends gripped her arm with a shaking hand and pointed a trembling finger toward the wall. Her eyes widened in shock at what she saw, then she fainted into her friend's arms. On the wall above her bed, written in her roommate's blood, were the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Next, narrator Danielle Hewitt is going to tell us two versions of a classic urban legend that preys on one of our most common pop culture fears, clowns. 
So sit back as Danielle tells us all about the clown statue. Let me start off by saying that this is not someone else's creepypasta story. I chose to submit it as such because of the fact that it is not originally written by me. This is a true story. All credits go to the original author. I figured that I would share this story on Creepypasta for all those to read who haven't already. So-and-so's friend, a girl in her teens, is babysitting for a family in Newport Beach, California. The family is wealthy and has a very large house. You know the sort, with a ridiculous amount of rooms. Anyway, the father tells the babysitter that once the children are in bed, she should go into this specific room. He doesn't really want her wandering around the house and watch TV there. The parents take off, and soon she gets the kids into bed and goes into the room to watch TV. She tries watching TV, but she's so disturbed by a clown statue in the corner of the room. She tries to ignore it for as long as humanly possible. But it starts freaking her out so much that she can't handle it. She resorts to calling the father and asks, Hey, the kids are in bed, but is it okay if I switch rooms? This clown statue is really creeping me out. The father says seriously, Get the kids. Go next door. Call 911. She asks, What's going on? He responds, Just go next door, and once you call the police, call me back. She gets the kids, goes next door and calls the police. When the police are on their way, she calls the father back and asks, So really, what's going on? He responds, We don't have a clown statue. He then further explains that the children have been complaining about a clown watching them as they sleep. He and his wife had just blown it off, assuming they were having nightmares. And now, Danielle is going to read for us the chain letter that started the whole thing. Subject, forward, clown. This creepy or what? A few years ago, a mother and a father decided they needed a break. So they wanted to head out for a night on the town. So they called their most trusted babysitter. When the babysitter arrived, the two children were already fast asleep in bed. So the babysitter just got to sit around and make sure everything was okay with the children. Later in the night, the babysitter got bored. And so she wanted to watch TV but she couldn't watch it downstairs because they didn't have cable downstairs. The parents didn't want their children watching too much garbage. So she called them and asked them if she could watch cable TV in the parents' room. Of course the parents said it was okay. But the babysitter had one final request. She asked if she could cover up the large clown statue in their bedroom with a blanket or cloth, because it was making her nervous. The phone line was silent for a moment, and the father, who was talking to the babysitter at the time, said, Take the children and get out of the house. We'll call the police. We don't have a clown statue. The children and the babysitter were murdered by the clown. It turned out to be that the clown was a killer that had escaped from jail. If you don't repost to ten peeps within five minutes, the clown will be standing next to your bed at 3 a.m. with his knife in his hand. I'd be hard-pressed to think of a more classic, horrifying scenario than one that involves a babysitter home alone in a house. Next up, Heather Thomas is going to tell us all about the man upstairs. A married couple were going out for the evening and called in a teenage babysitter to take care of their three children. 
When she arrived, they told her they probably wouldn't be back until late, and that the kids were already asleep, so she needn't disturb them. The babysitter starts doing her homework while awaiting a call from her boyfriend. After a while, the phone rings. She answers it, but hears no one on the other end. Just silence. Then whoever it is hangs up. After a few more minutes, the phone rings again. She answers, and this time there's a man on the line who says, in a chilling voice, Have you checked the children? Click. At first, she thinks it might have been the father calling to check up, and he got interrupted, so she decides to ignore it. She goes back to her homework, then the phone rings again. Have you checked the children? Says the creepy voice on the other end. Mr. Murphy? She asks, but the caller hangs up again. She decides to phone the restaurant where the parents said they'd be dining, but when she asks for Mr. Murphy, she is told that he and his wife had left the restaurant 45 minutes earlier. So she calls the police and reports that a stranger has been calling her and hanging up. Has he threatened you? The dispatcher asks. No, she says. Well, there's really nothing we can do about it. You could try reporting the prank caller to the phone company. A few minutes go by and she gets another call. Why haven't you checked the children? The voice says. Who is this? She asks. But he hangs up again. She dials 911 again and says, I'm scared. I know he's out there. He's watching me. Have you seen him? The dispatcher asks. She says no. Well, there isn't much we can do about it, the dispatcher says. The babysitter goes into panic mode and pleads with him to help her. Now, now, it'll be okay, he says. Give me your number and street address. And if you can keep this guy on the phone for at least a minute, we'll try to trace the call. What was your name again? Linda. Okay. Linda, if he calls back, we'll do our best to trace the call. But just keep calm. Can you do that for me? Yes, she says, and hangs up. She decides to turn the lights down so she can see if anyone's outside. And that's when she gets another call. It's me, the familiar voice says. Why did you turn the lights down? Can you see me? She asks, panicking. Yes, he says after a long pause. Look, you've scared me, she says. I'm shaking. Are you happy? Is that what you wanted? No. Then what do you want? She asks. Another long pause. Your blood. All over me. She slams the phone down, terrified. Almost immediately it rings again. Leave me alone! She screams. But it's the dispatcher calling back. His voice is urgent. Linda, we've traced that call. It's coming from another room inside the house. Get out of there, now! She tears to the front door, attempting to unlock it and dash outside, only to find the chain at the top still latched. In the time it takes her to unlock it, she sees a door open at the top of the stairs. Light streams from the children's bedroom, revealing the profile of a man standing just inside. She finally gets the door open and bursts outside, only to find a cop standing on the doorstep with his gun drawn. 
at this point, she's safe, of course. But when they capture the intruder and drag him downstairs in handcuffs, she sees he is covered in blood. Come to find out, all three children have all been murdered. The sleeping mind can be a funny thing. It can make you think you hear or even see things that aren't there. How many times have you thought you heard a bump in the night only to assume it was something else? But something, something in the back of your mind tells you it's all wrong. Next up, narrator Alicia Atkins is going to tell us about a classic urban legend entitled Licking. My great-grandmother lived up alone in the mountains at her cabin. Her husband was dead, so she was there all alone. She only had one companion, and that was her loving dog. They both adored each other, and the dog was a great comfort to her. Every night when she went to bed, the dog would lick her hand to let her know that he was there to protect her. One night, she had gone to bed and the dog had licked her hand, like he had done routinely every night since her husband died. But this night was different. She had woken up in the middle of the night because she had heard her dog whimpering. She wanted to comfort him and let her know that she was there for him, so she stuck her hand out by the bed and she felt the dog gently lick her hand like always. She figured he was just cold, so she went back to sleep. The dog's whimpering had woken her up a second time in the night, so she stuck her hand out. The dog licked it and she went back to sleep. This happened a third time and she stuck her hand out and the dog stopped whimpering and came and licked her hand. She stayed awake a few moments afterwards, and she went back to sleep again. In the morning, she woke up and stuck her hand out by the bed, but nothing licked her hand. She thought that the dog had already awakened and was just in the front room. She rolled over and got out of bed, and heard a drip, 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 drip. She thought the sound was coming from the kitchen, so she walked over and turned the handles on the sink faucet. But it wasn't the source of the noise. After frustratingly checking the sink and its pipes, she gave up and continued into her bathroom to take a shower. As she got closer to the bathroom door, it was evident that the sound was coming from within. She opened the door, looked above the bathtub, and gasped in utter horror. There... Hanging from the light by his collar was her loving companion. His blood was dripping into the bathtub. She screamed and began to cry. Wiping her eyes and sobbing, she turned and looked into the mirror. In the mirror, she saw the dog's reflection, and written on the mirror in her dog's blood, with drips and streaks hanging down from each letter, were the words, Humans can lick too. Some of the darkest and most menacing urban legends come from outside the United States. Please listen as Nate Dufort tells us one such tale of a mysterious car in the urban legend about the Black Volga. Black Volga and its drivers are one of the most known Slavic urban legends, widespread in Poland, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and even Mongolia. From a cryptozoological and paranormal point of view, it could also be one of the most bizarre cryptids ever seen, going as far as to the possibility of being a sentient, demonic car. The Volga story appeared back when Poland was known as the Polish People's Republic, first appearing around the early 1950s, continuing well into the 1970s, and even 1980s in some areas. The Volga itself allegedly had window drapes, white tires, and according to some relations, it had horns instead of wing mirrors, glowing red headlights, and jet black windows. It was described as rather fast for its model, far beyond maximum speed other Gaz-21 Volga could reach, the limousine that was allegedly used to abduct people, especially children. According to different versions, 
It was driven by priests, nuns, Jews, or strange paranormal beings with pale skin and red eyes, bearing a resemblance to albino people, which were actually vampires. One version even tells about the Volga being driven by Satan or some other demon. And by far the most bizarre one is about the car being sentient itself and driving around by itself. According to the stories, children were either killed inside or were kidnapped to use their blood as a cure for rich Westerners or Arabs suffering from leukemia. Other variants used organ theft as the motive, combining it with another famous legend about kidney theft by the KGB. The legend surfaced again in the late 20th century, with a BMW or Mercedes car taking the Volga's place. In this version, the driver would ask passers-by for the time and kill them when they approached the car to answer. In another version of the legend, the victim would die at the same time, a day later. Have you ever gone out for drinks with friends only to indulge a bit too much? Hopefully you made it home safe and without incident. The same can't be said for the subject of this classic urban legend about the risks in travel and the cruelty of strangers in a tale narrated by Collins Van Gordon called Kidneys on the Black Market. Kidneys on the Black Market. The crime begins when a business traveler goes to a lounge for a drink at the end of the workday. A person in the bar walks up as they sit alone and offers to buy them a drink. The last thing that the traveler remembers until they wake up in a hotel room bathtub, their body submerged to their neck in ice, is sipping that drink. There's a note taped to the wall instructing them not to move and to call 911. A phone is on a small table next to the bathtub for them to call. The business traveler calls 911 who has become quite familiar with this crime. The business traveler is instructed by the 911 operator to very slowly and very carefully reach behind them and feel if there is a tube protruding from their lower back. The business traveler finds the tube and answers yes. The 911 operator tells him to remain still, having already sent paramedics to help. The operator knows that both of the business traveler's kidneys have been harvested. And for our final urban legend this episode, Molly Langford is going to tell us about the lengths some people will go to for fashion and a few who may find themselves with the fatal hairdo. Example number one. A very stylish teenage girl grew tired of spending hours carefully ratting, teasing, and spraying her hair to attain an extreme beehive do. She washed her hair in sugar water, allowing it to harden in the style she wanted. At night, she carefully wrapped a towel around it and slept on a special half pillow designed not to disturb the hair. One morning, she failed to come down for breakfast. Her mother went to her room only to find her dead in bed. When the towel was removed from her head, it was discovered that she had been gnawed to death by bugs. Example number two. My mother grew up in Östersund, Sweden. When she was in her early teens, when beehive hairdos were popular, she was told about a girl in school who wrapped her hair around bread dough to achieve maximum height to her beehive. After about three weeks of her winning hairdo, she began to suffer severe headaches. She was finally taken to an emergency room, almost unconscious, where it was discovered that the dough, and consequently her scalp, was infested with maggots. Example number three. There's this guy who you might have seen walking around town with two huge dreadlocks on each side of his head. One day he decides to cut them off. 
So he's off to the hairdresser, and of course they can't get the clippers through his hair. So out comes the biggest pair of scissors you've ever seen. They start to hack into one of the dreads and get about halfway through, when he starts screaming and runs out of the shop. His girlfriend finds him dead in their flat the next day. The coroner found that a nest of red-backed spiders had moved into his hair and started biting him when the scissors cut their nest to bits. Example number four. Email message. Please take caution. Pass this along to your friends and family. Must read. Something terrible happened to a 10-year-old girl who had braids. The little girl had been wearing her braids in a ponytail for the longest time, and apparently the braids were old, at least two to three months old. And the mother never took them down to wash them or let them air out or anything. Anyway, the girl had been complaining about having a headache for approximately two weeks to her mother, who just brushed it off, assuming that she had hit her head against the wall or something. Well, one morning, the child complained to her mother about having a headache while getting ready for school. Again, the mother brushed her off. When the child got to school, she told her teacher that her head was hurting. The teacher assumed that the braids were too tight in the child's hair and attempted to let the ponytail down. When she removed the hairpiece and let the braids loose, there was a spider in the child's hair. The spider had laid eggs in the child's hair, and the spiders were eating her scalp. The child was rushed to the hospital, where she later died. This happened in Monroe, Louisiana. It was all over the news and in the papers for about a week or two. Please, parents, don't leave braids or any kind of hair extension in your children's or your own hair for more than two to three weeks. I hope you've all enjoyed our little wander down Urban Legend Road. If you didn't hear your favorite urban legends this week, don't worry. We still have more to come. Until then, feel free to reach out to us on social media or at creepypod at gmail.com with your favorite urban legends. Until next week, stay creepy. For more information, including pictures and videos of the stories told on this podcast, or to suggest stories for future episodes, please visit us at CreepyPod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or email us at CreepyPod at gmail.com. All stories told on this podcast can be found at creepypastawikia.com and are protected by a Creative Commons license. Some rights reserved unless otherwise stated.